and we're on. <laughs> yeah. How many times have we started it like that? Exactly like that. Where I say, and we're live, and, and then you give some And I do laugh. some stupid thing, <laughs> <laughs> or like some really full of fit. Yeah. Yeah. It's always like a... I don't know what else to say, dude. I know. I feel like... Uh, I feel like... Um, do you ever watch that one Louis C.K. special where he's like just acknowledges that he just doesn't know how to start a comedy special? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I'm not... I don't know how to start these things. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I feel you, bro. Oh, my God. That dude's hilarious. I, yeah. I haven't seen his new one yet. Everyone keeps saying that it's amazing. There's two new ones. I haven't seen either. Yeah, yeah, that's what's weird. He, I think he won a um, – what is it that – not an Oscar, obviously, but what's underneath that? An, I, dude, an I, Emmy? Yeah. Not a Grammy. Golden Globe. I don't know. Yeah. I, Grammys I, are for I music, I right? I really don't know. People are like, yeah. these guys are idiots. Yeah. He, yeah, he won a Tony. <laughs> for musicals what an SB. Yeah, an SB. Uh, the Pulitzer. <laughs> I uh just watched uh went, we went to Bill Burr a couple weeks ago oh yeah how was that it was awesome yeah, yeah. it was fun so you know how Rogan like will talk about how like you know before a special comics will go just like work shit out work out a bit mm -hmm. so he was doing that and so he was completely riffing for like half of it but just legit off the cuff funny as hell it's like that dude's talented, man. It's yeah. Like, I mean, you you could, I mean, he had like Utah specific jokes and everything, which is planned ahead of time. But I mean, he was, he at least appeared to be going off the cuff, just kind of thinking stuff out. And I don't know. That's, that's where you see real talent. It's like, damn dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's kind of cool. I missed that. I was, I was, uh, actually got invited to go to that, but then that was the same weekend that I had to, I had to go shoot that Buffalo. So, Oh yeah. That's yeah. a way cooler thing though. Yeah. There was no, I wasn't going to give up on that. So yeah, yeah, that was pretty sweet. Yeah. So I, yeah, I got Congrats that meat too. That. I know. Hey, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I got that meat too. It wasn't like a crazy hunt or a hunt I, at all. I mean, yeah, probably, all. probably not as like enduring as the elk you got a couple of years back. Yeah. I got to tell you about the, man, I got to show you a video of they were, it was kind of weird because they well weird and sad in its own little way. Like after after you shot it, like it's almost like they gave it its own funeral. Like all of the herd started surrounding it and trying to like like you know get it to get back up and everything. And obviously it wasn't getting back up. And, yeah. And then there was one other really big bull that was there. It was like establishing its dominance on it, you know, and mess around with it. it sounds like a damn gri like, grizzly like the, bear. The the bull was like establishing dominance over the dead buffalo yeah 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 basically <laughs> like kicking it while it's letting down. everybody know hey hey yeah. i'm i'm king so he's like making it out like he did that to the buffalo yeah, yeah. It's like you want some of this? just to let yeah. you know yeah. just to let you know so well yeah. this is our uh our last bit i think our last episode of the year right oh man closing 2022 so at the end of this we gotta say see you next year uh, <laughs> Dude, i'll never say that i wonder i wonder how many people think they're clever when they say that, you know, it, you can hear it in their tone. <laughs> yeah. That they think, Oh man, yeah, I've got it. This is great. I've got it. They're going to think a whole year from now, but really, I just mean a week from now. <laughs> <laughs> Cause see what happens is you go another day and then that's the next year, you yeah. know? <laughs> it's like a, Thanks okay, for yeah, explaining I, that I, dick. I, yeah, I, yeah. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is kind of funny, but uh, yeah, you got any got any big plans for Christmas? Just hanging out with the fam? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, wife's brother is in town. He lives in New York with his wife, so I, I get along well with that dude. So oh, cool. Good to see him. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go check out uh, Avatar tomorrow. Avatar two. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to you it. Get, I want to know what you think of it. I keep getting all over the board reviews. Well, uh, here's. Here's what I noticed. I heard I heard some uh I heard uh, on a couple podcasts that James Cameron came out and said that you know testosterone is a poison that you have to purge from your body. He you said know? that. Yeah, oh yeah. And s something like that. I mean, but it almost spot on is what he said. Oh. Um and that when he was younger, a lot of his movies were based on, you know, testosterone laden uh, uh, creativity. Um, yeah, that's probably true. Which I, I totally agree with, you know, like, uh, I, I don't know, arguably one of the best like action movies of all time, Terminator right. two. Right. I was like, uh, yeah, okay. A little that's bit what, of test there. So I was like, and then he said that he has, he, he has since successfully purged himself of that. 
and that found its way, and then he's expressing that through Avatar 2. Now, oh, I checked out the Rotten Tomato scores, and it's like, I don't know, high 70s with the critics, but then it's like low 90s with the audience, right? And then I looked at some of the audience reviews, and a lot of the audience reviews that gave it like a one star, because I'm like, okay, what'd they say? And I found five in a row, bro, five in a row that said this movie was way too violent and there's way too many four letter words in here to bring your kids to. I was like, oh, send it. I'm yeah, going. So it's like, good. I hope, I mean, <laughs> violence always <laughs> yeah, seems to yeah, solve it for yeah. me. You know, I, I, I just think about like some of the movies that have flopped recently. You know, there's a recipe, there's a recipe and it's called Top Gun Maverick. And Hell you, yeah. You just watch that Absolutely. and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And I'll make a gajillion dollars on movies. Right. Just that, yeah, that follow right Follow that template. You're fine. <laughs> and, you got, and you got it. <laughs> So, yeah, no, that'll be cool. So, um, yeah, in our last episode, we kind of teased the idea of talking a little bit more about um, this, our, our dudes that are in treatment right now getting scammed for like online, online type scams, right? And we said we kind of do a deeper dive into that. And you actually developed a, uh, um, a, a group session for this. So like a guideline for a group session that that we were going to be able to have here. So um, I thought we'd just spend some time talking about that today and going through some of the stuff. I looked some stuff up on this. It's kind of crazy, some of the stats associated with it. But but uh, so I think that's what we're going to be doing today. You cool with that? Yeah. Dude. dude. It, 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 honestly, it was like, so after we kind of teased that idea, it, so I've had, I've been thinking about doing this for a couple of years, like just coming up with something. I just keep procrastinating, but it was, it was legit like two or three days after our last podcast that one of our therapists like complained out loud, like God, my client just got sucked into this thing. I mean, it was another catfish. I was like, man, all right, I, it's, I got to just crank this. Out. I have to do yeah, something. Yeah, I have to do something. Yeah. <laughs> something I at must least be want done. to feel like I've provided enough warning. I mean, no one's going to take heed because everyone, when they're got, when they get caught up in these catfish things, they think that they're unique and this one they're talking to, they're legit. Right. That, that, no, that they couldn't possibly be be getting fooled like all those other suckers boom three thousand dollars later right right well uh so i was doing some i was doing some i guess i don't know research on this but i gotta i gotta get your thoughts on one thing before we jump into the the content of this uh of this um this uh this lesson that you put together so i'm gonna show you a picture right here and i'm just gonna feel vindicated today because I have a phobia, okay, that you're aware of, and that I'll share with the rest of the audience today, okay? okay? And for those of you who chose to watch the YouTube video, you will see what I'm talking about. So, Jeff, what am I afraid of? Ants. Okay. That, my friend, is an up-close-and-personal visual of an ant's face. Oh, God. Are you serious? Yeah. That's an... No, come on. Okay. Are you for so real? Here's its eyes. Here's its eyes. Here's its antenna. That's a legit demon that on this planet. Is that's a crazy. That's looking. a here's that, its, that really that's here's the, its pinchers right here. That's legit, dude. That's a de- yeah yeah that one that that was on CNN. I mean I don't I don't know what you think about CNN, but I'm saying that is that's a, a very up close and personal. What's up with his mouth? Yeah, that's a real now see like a lot of people watch Ant Man and they see the ant become bigger and it's all friendly and stuff. I was like, no, that's a demon. That really is a demon. That's a real live demon on this planet, except it's miniature. But that t- look how terrifying Does, that is. Doesn't the size negate the scariness of it, though? No, I mean, so no, little. that's that's super scary right there. So this is what you see when you see an ant. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like I mean, I'm just I'm just saying. What's that, up with this? What, like obviously those aren't teeth. What are those? I don't know. Demon. Bat? Yeah, De- demon spawn. Demon spawn. <laughs> demon whiskers. That, so I'm, okay. Yeah, All right, I'm just telling you that's a. Yeah, those are terrifying creatures. Where's his pinchers? Right here. See, you can see them kind of interlaced right here. Oh, yeah. See, but that's that's a that's a demon on Earth, and and yeah, people that's not say CGI. Huh? That's like a no, legit. Zo- that's a legit zoomed that's in picture. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People say I'm weird for being afraid of ants. <laughs> Well, if they were that size, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, you think tardigrades or whatever those things are? Those yeah. are gnarly too. So you called, uh, so you called this, um, you called this, uh, this, this, 
uh, group the the grooming catfish. So where did that where did the origins of that the name of well, that come from? Part of the reason I procrastinated getting this done is like, well, how the hell is this? What's this got to do with like sex offender treatment? You know, it just seems kind of like a one off group, just like a concept. Like, hey, beware of scam artists. It's like, what's that got to do with yeah treatment? And then like. I think I talked about it in a previous podcast uh, that, you know, the, the four barriers to sexual offending that David Finkelhor concept from, mm-hmm. I think it's from pathways book. Mm-hmm. I've always loved that. It's just such a concise way, especially when you have the visual graphic that's in the pathways book. It's such a concise way to like teach a client and to help them process through, especially in the early days, kind of the pathway to offending and helping them understand their own motivations and stuff. And so I was thinking that, a person that's being catfished is on the other end of being groomed in a sense. And so I, I, w- I wanted to make sure that I'm not equating being on the receiving end of a catfish scam artist as being equivalent to a victim of sexual reoffense, but the, the, the means through which the catfish perpetrates on a lonely, unsuspecting poor sap, mm-hmm. uh, has many of the same elements as yeah. a perpetrator committing, you know, uh, offending on a victim. And so I was like, you know, let's, I want to teach this concept to the offenders, the clients, get them to describe their own pathway through the four barriers. And then once we have that, then, then I like once, once that's established and everybody understands, you know, motivation, internal, external overcoming victims resistance, then it's like, all right, now let's work it in reverse. And then like, let's, let's try to bulletproof our clients so that they're, they understand how they've manipulated people. Maybe they'll see it coming if, uh, if they look at it through that lens, that was kind of the idea. Yeah. And I think, I I mean, ultimately a lot of people will listen to this and and they might say, well, they deserve it. They got their, it's like karma, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Coming around. And what I, I mean, I guess the one thing I would think is that if our clients are to remain, you know, stable in the community, we ought to not like reinforce natural consequences onto them. I mean, they're already dealing with, you know, a lot of natural consequences associated with their offense. And when I, I'm talking about um, restrictions on their livelihoods that is, you know, consistent with their probation and parole conditions, makes sense. I think if you read through them, most most people would agree with a lot of the rules that are in there. Yeah. Maybe some not, um, but nevertheless, they do exist. But we shouldn't be as therapists trying to tack on like or endorse new natural consequences. It's onto not our them. Role. Like right, that's not that's not really our role. And so, um, whenever we're dealing with this, we're just addressing some of these things. That, uh, as far as trying to limit their exposure to to any additional risk. And as I was looking into this, I think it a lot of our clients fit this profile um, with with some of the some of the statistics that came out about this. So it was, uh, yeah, I was, I was looking at some of this into this. So these are some catfishing stats. Uh, men surprise, surprise are, are statistically more likely than women to catfish. Okay. Or to get catfish, I should say. Right. So it says, um, or no, yeah, men are slightly more likely to catfish someone than women. My bad. So catfishing doesn't, uh, doesn't foreground one gender disproportionately. Uh, both men and women are guilty of it, but statistically, it is men who are likely to commit the deed more often. One study also found that increased attachment anxiety is one of the major driving forces for individuals to become both a perpetrator and a target. And that's from ResearchGate. So that was one of the things I thought that was kind of hmm. like men are more likely to do it. I was legit wondering that. Uh, so you, you actually <laughs> looked into it. Yeah. So, so men do it more. Yeah. And one in five, one in five perpetrators will pretend to be someone of the opposite gender. And oh, is, really? Yes. Uh, okay. So it's around 24% of all catfishing perpetrators pose a, pose as a different gender. Many victims struggle to accept the truth, especially if they have formed a romantic attachment. Oh my God, dude. That's so accurate. Catfishing online dating statistics further indicate that men are more likely to lie about their finances when compared to women, while women lie more about their age. Regardless of gender, 54% of online daters feel the person they talk to is using a fictional account. One way to verify if it's true is to run the person's name, last name, and other known details through people finder sites. And this is from freebackgroundchecks.com. 
I, I, I've heard that running a, the reverse pitcher uh-huh. lookup thing is a good way to, I think you can just do that through Google, right? Yeah. Like you can look, they can like, I mean, I think I, it's a function, like a function on Google that you can like post a picture and it will trace the source so that the person you're looking at. Oh, so it won't like do like facial recognition, but it'll trace the the source of the picture. I don't know how it works, but yeah, yeah, probably like not that. facial recognition. Okay. But but yeah, the, you, you're talking about like the, the what, what's the people search thing? The Yeah, it says, uh, yeah, uh, regardless of gender, 54% of, on, this is what's crazy, 54% of online daters feel the person they talk to is using a fictional account. Oh, so half the people, they already feel like they're talking to somebody that's, that's fake. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of nuts. One way to verify that is to run the person's name, last name and other known details through people finder sites. So is that people like ignoring their gut basically like, like this person said, <clears throat> like I want this to be true so bad. I, you know, my emotions get wrapped up with this person. It, they, it, I I want this connection. It seems fishy, catfishy, but I'll keep. But you know, I'll just keep pushing. Is that what it is? I don't know. I mean that that seems <clears throat> that seems plausible that that would be the reason why. Um, I mean, half of them are thinking that this is, but that, that doesn't bear out with the statistics. I mean, it's good to be mindful of of those individuals, you know, with whom you might. Eng- I, mean, I'm, I don't even know why girls go on dates with dudes. I've never understood it. Like, dudes are gross. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, the 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 <clears throat> setup for a romantic date or a heinous murder all start the same. Like, <laughs> hey, do you want to come with me in my car alone at night? Like. <laughs> It's a, it's it's a, roll it, the all, dice, it all it? starts the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems, yeah, I mean. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> I don't know if I, I guess, I guess yeah. it is. Well, so this one was, I thought this was, so 41% of catfishers, those who are doing the catfishing, cited loneliness as their motivation. I buy it. But it also kind of seems like the ones who are catfished are also susceptible to that. Cause yes. It says, uh Though it's difficult to imagine life with an on, without an online presence, the ethics of online identities is a complex phenomenon. It is the psychology the psychology of catfishing? Internet catfishing statistics rank psycho- psychologically distressing circumstances such as loneliness or dissatisfaction with their physical appearance as major driving forces that push people to assume a fictional identity online often falling off the track. And that was published by the conversation, you know, kind of in the equating some of the motivations with the, you know, the setup with sexual offending, but I I don't have the number, but loneliness is right up there as well as a motivating factor for uh, a perpetrator. I mean, how many of our dudes have to solve a loneliness puzzle in their success plan? Well, and it's not, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, when we're thinking about, like cognitive distortions, right? Or what others might refer to as thinking errors. They're always bolstered by, you know, strong emotions. And um, w- over the last few years, I've really learned to grasp onto this idea that, you know, emotions aren't good. They're not bad. They're just kind of neutral. Yeah. And you can have an opinion on those emotions as to whether or not you like them. But ultimately, they're just kind of alarm bells that something important is happening, right? And so, but it seems like without any resolution of the emotion, you know, without any um, appropriate regulation, it's just going to further distort the way that you think about things. Cause it kind of gets into a weird feedback loop. Like you have, you start thinking about, I haven't had a date in over a year. You know, I, I, um, last time I, my, my dating profile, I don't have anybody hitting me up on it or anything. And so I experienced loneliness as a result of those thought thoughts. Right. But then I don't, I can't do anything about it necessarily. So then that loneliness come, comes back and it affects my thoughts even more, you know? So now I'm like compounding it over and over again. And I think it makes people more susceptible to being catfished because they just want, they, they just want to believe like you want to believe that aliens are real. They just want to believe that, that thing that's talking to them on the other end, whatever it is. is even real. if they have the gut feeling like, ah, oh, this seems Something's off about this, but uh, that the loneliness just overrides their uh, that I don't want to call it intuition, but you know that sense that 
things are off. Well, why else? I mean, how else could you explain it? You know what I mean? Like you, again, if you're exercising some empathy and you put yourself in their shoes, you have to ask, okay, under what circumstances would I fall for this? You know what I mean? To be, yeah, really. Yeah. Lo- I mean, right. Yeah. yeah. Lo- loneliness is, a, is that's the thing that comes up. Cause you, you like when you're watching these, I assume you've probably watched like, um, the, the, uh, catfish or, or right. something like it, or, um, there's a really good one on Netflix. It's called, uh, it's the untold series. It's, uh, what is that guy's name? Manti Teo, I think is his name. Oh yeah. I didn't and know he was, show, but- yeah, he was, uh, he was, is that what his name is? Am I saying that correctly? Yeah. He, and he yeah. was uh, nominated for the Heisman yeah. yeah. and he got, <clears throat> and they, they thought that both his, his girl and his grandma passed away in the same year or something like that. And that girl never was the girl. Like that was some dude God, that he used to play right. football with. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, now you can watch that and it's almost like, um, I think a lot of people criticized him. And we're like, what an idiot. How could he fall for that? Like, what a more, you know, stuff like that. Of course, people were thinking that. And so I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe that's the case, you know. Um, On the other hand, you have really put yourself there and say, okay, under what circumstances would I believe that that was true, you know? And it would have to be quite a bit of emotional distress. I mean, I, I learned through that documentary that he was LDS, but he was going to school at Notre Dame. Those are two very different religions, you know. Dude, I, I really like the thought process, the thought experiment you're asking. I, I just want to highlight that because that's useful for the listeners, you know, under what circumstances, like what would have to be going on in my life for me to actually believe that? Don't don't just dismiss it off cuff. Like try, try to legit think that one through. Give you yeah. a lot better understanding of. I, I honestly think that we do that mistakenly because we want to create the idea that we would never be susceptible to something like that. Yeah. So we put up that barrier ourselves and say, moron, how, you know, I'm like, well, uh, maybe, maybe (laughs) maybe that's true. Or maybe he was dealing with some life circumstances and some emotional regulation stuff that unfortunately just led to that type of thinking. You know what I mean? Dude, a, a lot of these guys that get catfished, they, they've told me that, before it happened, they would look disdainfully at other people that got suckered in by it as well. Like mm-hmm. idiot. And then, you know, and then, and then comes yeah, the criticism. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those poor guys. Yeah. So, uh, catfishing victims, uh, per 100,000 residents in the United States rose 52% <laughs> from 2015 to 2019. Jeez. It's crazy. 52%. I know. I know. I couldn't, um, that catfishing the, this, uh, this other one is, let's see here. Romance scams take place more on social media than on dating platforms. Hmm. I should say T H A N not T H E N. But yeah. So the, in other words, like dating on like Facebook or finding a hookup through Instagram versus like eHarmony. Is that, is that cause dating sites vet the subscriber more than a social media platform? I think so. I think there's some sort of, um, I mean, I don't know if I want to say background checks. It just seems like there's, there's more of a vetting process, right? Yeah. 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 And that one, the, the Nigerian print scam, which everybody knows about and nevertheless, it still makes almost a million dollars per year. Wild how that still, <laughs> Can you believe still? Can you believe people. that? Can you believe that crap? I, I yeah, no, that's unreal. Uh, it's face- a it's a joke, even like I people know. joke about. I that. know, yeah. like yeah. Facebook took down 1.3 billion fake accounts <laughs> what? in three months. Three months. <laughs> Wait, that's there's a- there's eight billion people on Earth. Yeah, <laughs> there's 1.3 billion fake accounts. <laughs> yeah, in three that's months. Stupid. Three I mean, it, it, <laughs> yeah. If you do, how is that possible? <laughs> 1.3 billion dude there's 8 billion how is that well so you're, you're taking down <laughs> per year you're taking down more accounts than there are people on the planet yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's true oh my god in that's 2020 amazing. u.s catfishing victims lost over 600 million dollars in dude. romance scams 600 million dollars our clients are about 10 percent of that <laughs> Dude, this was specifically. No. So, this is kind of a crappy million. slide, but if you had to, well, yeah. Without looking at that, look at me. If you had to take a guess, 
what would you say is the state that gets catfished the most? Hmm. Uh, well, now you're going to make me say Utah, but I'm not going to say Utah. It's but, not Utah. But, okay. I'll give you a hint. <laughs> a hint. Yeah. Let's let's go with uh, North Dakota. Close. Oklahoma. Oh, Close. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's by cost of per uh, catfishing victim. But now this is per catfishing victim by state. Okay. So in Oklahoma, per catfishing victim, seventy thousand dollars two hundred eighty eight. Seventy thousand two hundred. What's that dollar amount though? That's oh cat- cost per catfishing but- victim. By state. Oh, what in the hell? Yeah, Utah is relatively low. 19,926. Per victim? Yeah, yeah. Lowest is is Maine. I, I guess they just don't put up with crap up there. Dude, we <laughs> 3, should become... 3,820. We should become catfishers, bro. <laughs> well, so this is... I thought this was kind of... Um, this is kind of oh, cool, though. God. U.S. states uh, that were most likely and least likely to get catfish. Most mm. likely... Nev- top 10... Starting uh, starting with number one, Nevada, number one, N- number two, Wyoming, Washington, Utah, Alaska, New Hampshire, Minnesota, Florida, Oregon, Maryland. Least likely to get, get catfished, South Dakota, Mississippi, Iowa, Louisiana, Maine, Kansas, Vermont, Nebraska, Ohio, and North Carolina. My brain's wanting to put those into like, you know, I see the, the red and blue states. It's like, yeah, okay, I, I can't really see, I don't see political trends there necessarily. I no. don't see. Because Oregon and Washington are for sure blue states. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, so the reason I said North Dakota, which I'm wrong on, and for that to that point, South Dakota is actually the least likely. I, I was thinking like low population density places. Yeah. Would be high. I don't know what to, like, I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. 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 It, it basically uh, it says statistics. Um, let me see what they say about this one. Because this one's kind of, this one's a little weird. Um, yeah. Cat, I guess it's kind of like uh, the, the places that are most targeted. Uh, statistics about catfishing online suggest that the surge in this phenomenon maintains its upward curve um, more in the, uh, in some places more than others. According to a recent study, Nevada. Wyoming are two states where people are most likely to fall victim to catfishing. At the same time, South Dakota, Mississippi were noted as the safest in this regard. That's from highspeedinternet.com. So I don't know if it's about the population makeup that is making them more likely to get that. Um, hmm. And then one more here. This was, yeah. Uh, yeah. So compared from 2019, 2020, which is still crazy, 475 million compared to 600 million dollars amount of money lost due to romance and confidence scams over yeah. one year. Yeah. That, that was the 475 source was- to 600 million. That's so a 125 million jump. Right. Exactly. Dude. So so the so now I think that gives a good like reason for us to to kind of get into like showing this to clients. It, it's something that I think our population is perhaps a little bit more vulnerable to. Yeah. And why, um, why is that? I think, well, I think ultimately, you know, like, um, these guys inherently are going to be, um, lonely when they're first getting, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, when we're, um, you know, like we work in institutions, right. That have, that are of incarcerated individuals. And, um, I don't know. You you work with inmates who, you know, they're hardened drug dealers and gangbangers and all the rest of it. And how accurate are they when they say, oh, yeah, that guy's a sex offender? How often are they correct? Like picking them out? Yeah. They, they, they do all right. Almost always, yeah. right? Yeah. And now why do you think that is? Not to answer your question with a question, but why do you think that is? Why are, why are they good at picking out a sex offender? Yeah. That, I mean, maybe they start to look for uh, behavioral trends and kind of ways of communicating. They look for someone that's maybe socially awkward or maybe doesn't quite know how to maybe maybe not have some of the social charisma that some people have. Right. So I look at a lot of our clients and, and unfortunately that social awkwardness and just like based on their general appearance, their hygiene and grooming habits and just how they present themselves 
it, it becomes more and more obvious to me even when I have never even met somebody and they're sitting in front of me and I'm like, okay, before I even start talking to them about their offense, I'm like, why is this person here? And I usually can do pretty good about picking it out, okay? I don't know if that's stereotypical. I'm just saying that there are traits that are pretty consistent. Pattern recognition. Right. And so what I would say is that also lends to social awkwardness, not just, I mean, if, you know, the jail or any other institution is kind of a microcosm of what that turns into, into actual society. I can't imagine they're knocking it out of the park with, you know, with people in, in the general public, you know, when it comes to making new social connects. Certainly not. So that's why I think just based on the social awkwardness and the overall lack of social skills that they probably have, um, and, and probably not, too much in the dating profile history anyway, which will lead to a lack of confidence to kind of move some of that forward, I think kind of makes them easy targets like for a, a lot of this. Perfect storm of variables that <laughs> makes you vulnerable, huh? Yeah. Damn. I mean, you might say poor dudes, which I'm not. I'm just saying that, that you know, I think recognizing exactly what it is for what it is. Yeah. So, so um, the goals you put in this were, so if you're running this group and let's say you're a clinician or let's say you're a client who's going over some of this stuff. Um, the goals in writing this as you were writing this was to help clients recognize grooming methods within the context of Finkel Horse free, uh, four preconditions for sexual abuse, help clients recognize not just their own history of grooming, but also if they're currently being groomed through the modern day phenomenon of catfishing. And then lastly is to help clients establish uh, healthy relationship boundaries by recognizing manipulation techniques they have used on others and techniques others may use on them. Does that sound about right? Yeah, man. Okay. I like it. Um, okay. So here's kind of these four barriers. Uh, and as it relates to sexual abuse, do you kind of want to like maybe explain those kind yeah. of what they are? Yeah, sure. And so the, the idea here is that there are four barriers or hurdles that stand between, uh, potential perpetrator and a potential victim. So, you know, for me, I like to even have the clients imagine all four different barriers and, you know, each, each barrier must be somehow navigated or, um, tra- you know, traversed, uh, to circumvented, to the next. circumvented. Yes. Um, so the, the first barrier is motivation the the, the client has to want to engage in that behavior. And yeah. So motivate like in the sexual abuse context, Motivation could be, you know, sexual arousal. Obviously, um, sometimes the clients have unmet emotional needs, you know, blockages, you know, uh, loneliness. Again, uh, some of these dudes get traumatized at a young age and for whatever reason, they end up acting out sexually uh, on the same age group that they were when they were uh, sexually perpetrated. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, there's a, you know, the kind of the power and control motivation that some of these guys have to dominate somebody. Yeah. So yeah, the, the motivation they have to want to, if, if they don't want to, if there's no desire there, uh, it's dead in the water that, so once they've traversed or circumvented that first barrier mm-hmm. of motivation, then it's up to, uh, their, you know, their conscience, their Jiminy cricket, their still small voice. Yeah. You know, most, like, so they have to first want to do it. It has to first want to do it. Okay. And then a lot of these guys, uh, maybe to the listener, believe it or not, aren't actually sociopaths. Some are, but a lot aren't. They have a conscience. They mm-hmm. they know what they're doing is wrong. They they do have a moral compass. And they they if their motivation to offend is strong enough, then they'll circumvent that by lying to themselves going through some series of mental gymnastics. They all the thinking errors that we talk about in therapy, rationalization, mm-hmm. justification, minimizing all the different ways that they might tell themselves that what they're doing isn't bad. They might tell themselves she likes it. Uh, she's old enough to know what she's doing. Uh, just this once. Uh, it's not really that big a deal happened to me. So whatever at this point, they'll, they'll tell themselves something to, to, uh, pacify their conscience and they truly have to believe it too yeah like i mean it can't just be pillow talk you know like th- this is something they have to truly believe uh, that what they're telling themselves at this point yeah well, yeah yeah that like 
I was thinking about that actually. So yeah, they have to legit have commitment to the belief they used to smash Jiminy Cricket and, or like, you know, the concept of compartmentalizing, yeah. you know? And so like they, a lot of these dudes live double lives and, you know, within their own mind as well that we'll have guys, I'm sure you've had a bunch of clients that had super strong religious convictions, lived the part, believed in what they were doing. And it wasn't even necessarily a front for sexually deviant behaviors, although that exists too, but they, they were legit living like a, a morally straight life. And then also this other side of them. Yeah. With the exception of this one horrible aspect of right. their behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that some of that compartmentalizing, I guess it's maybe under the umbrella of that second barrier, the internal barrier. Well, and if my Jiminy cricket, my conscience is telling me that even though I would like to do this, it's probably the wrong thing to do. I, I think about that when we use like replacement thoughts um, with our clients, you know, when we're using cognitive restructuring, this is kind of cognitive restructuring, but it's not deliberate cognitive restructuring. It's kind of happening because, you know, they're, they're trying to move towards this, this perpetration piece. Cause like I, I always use the example of, let's say a client's, a, you know, has a, has an affinity for cocaine, you know, they've, they've got an addiction with, for, with, uh, of cocaine and, mm-hmm. and, and they, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, the, the initial thought is, man, doing some cocaine would be really good right now. And the replacement thought cannot be, man, cocaine sucks. And, and why is that? Because it's unbelievable because right. cocaine doesn't suck. Right. Okay. I've never done it, but I assume it's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Because that's, that's, I mean, how many movies have been made about cocaine being it awesome? Seems to be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I assume it's great. So you, so the story you tell yourself has to be believable. And I think whatever mental gymnastics is you were talking about that they're saying has to be believable equally. Otherwise they're not going to get over those internal barriers. Right. Yeah. So what's barrier three? They have to be able to arrange for the environment to be conducive to commit an offense. So they have to find a way to get the victim alone. They have to maybe lure the victim, you know, maybe, maybe they're out at a nightclub that, you know, girls out with their friends and, the guy has to lure her away from her other friends and maybe uh, put something in her drink classic, but things like that. Yeah. Uh, um, well, uh, another just cliche example uh, to get around the environment would be like babysitting or something. Oh, okay. Or putting yourself into a position like Scoutmaster. Yeah. Or, you know, d- just ways to gain access to the victim while avoiding detection. In other words, the actual logistical makeup of, yeah. of, of the, um, you know, the, wherever the offense is going to take place has to lend to you being capable of doing this. That's right. I mean, in the middle of a shopping mall during black Friday, probably, probably not, not going to happen. happen, but, um, alone Friday night when you're babysitting, parents are out and the, you know, you, and the kids of a certain age, Okay, prime time at that point. Right. Okay. Okay. Lastly, the fourth <clears throat> barrier is so now we we have the the motivation barrier has been crossed. They want to do it. They've uh, squashed down their conscience by bypassing the internal barrier. They found a way to get around the environmental barrier by getting the victim alone. Then, lastly, it's overcoming the victim's resistance. That's the fourth barrier: overcoming the victim's resistance. And so. You know, the the most obvious way is when we think about forcible rape is, you know, physically forcing them. Mm -hmm. Um, But then there's, you know, coercion, you know, like sexual pressure, uh, you know, guilt trips. You know, if you're thinking about date rape a little bit, um, grooming, bribes, uh, promises. There's, uh, you know, like doing whatever you can do to lower the victim's guard so that they either are forced into it or acquiesce or maybe they get tricked into thinking that things are one way but they're another yeah so you're you're not necessarily looking for consent you're looking for compliance right at this point exactly i was thinking about these four barriers and i was thinking like um i mean is it necessary that they go in order i don't know like maybe not i was i was bringing this up in um you know, like uh, um, access to like or like 
like for risk purposes, right? Um, the, like if you, if you had, uh, say you had a guy that, you know, had access to the internet unsupervised, um, nobody else around. Um, and you know, is that guy more or less likely to look at child pornography? Okay. And then somebody who has no access to the internet, you know, all things being equal. And a lot of people say none. Well, I don't have a motivation to look at that, but I'm like, well, yeah, but you, you already have the device and the access to what you need. Yes. You don't have the motivation, technically more likely, but though. technically you're more likely on a percentage wise. That's why, I mean, hmm. I, I think regardless of whichever area you're moving in, as you're paying attention to these, one thing I try to tell clients is, um, you know, we're, we're always trying to reinforce these barriers at all times. Like we're trying to reinforce these barriers so that it's more difficult for us to overcome these barriers. If you don't have motivation to do this right now, awesome. But that doesn't mean just give up on the other three, you know, like don't find yourself in high risk situations where you are babysitting, even though, you know, you don't have any motivation to do this. If you've previously done that, okay, well, you only have one barrier to overcome and you're already in a spot where it can happen. You know what I mean? Because so the be other smart, three are, not strong. Right? right. Exactly. I'm just yeah. saying lend to those barriers being greater than they are, you know, lessening them. I, I get that motivation gets a lot of credit in this, but at the same time, like you can't overlook the other three because, you know, that's what, so I'm not saying it goes in the other direction, but you know, if the other either. three are gone and motivations and you get over that, that barrier. Well, all bets are off at that I'll point. I bet you a lot of relapses have happened that way. For sure. Yeah. Allowing uh, themselves to be in riskier and riskier environments. And Right. What yeah. is that? What's that saying? Like the, if you spend long enough time in a barbershop, you'll probably start doing heroin or something. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah. Is that how it yeah, goes? I think that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, dude, I was I was kind of uh, impressed that you that you looked into catfishing and, and where it came from. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like <laughs> yeah. where the term, I didn't even know until I, I read this from you. Yeah, dude, apparently <laughs> so, so what I've been led to believe <laughs> is that, uh, it's a, it's a method for preserving the integrity of fish of, of cod. And so I guess if you, you know, if you're shipping fish long distances across the world for, you know, from maybe one port to another, by the time the cod gets from port A to port B, um, if if just if the cod, cod are just kind of in a whatever the hell they transport fish in, they they get fish buckets. Yeah, fish buckets. <laughs> yeah. The 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 meat, the integrity of the meat gets mushy and just kind of gross and otherwise uh, distasteful. And you know, and maybe that's because the you know the fish they they're not they're not active. They're not swimming around. They're they're uh, they. They get sedentary, maybe. And so it's so, like the opposite of veal. Like you want veal to be. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, you want your veal to be tender. Yeah. You don't want your fish to be mushy. Okay, yeah, I suppose you go. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently, if you add a couple catfish, like actual catfish, the fish in with the cod, the the catfish keep the cod on their toes. I don't know if they like nip at their fins or some shit, but, <laughs> <laughs> but apparently cod get super motivated to like work out or something when the when the catfish are around. And so, do you think they're attracted to the catfish? Oh, so they like want to stay in get shape swole for it. So they yeah. try. <laughs> yeah. Oh damn, yeah, girl! Check out those gills, <laughs> <laughs> those whiskers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. I'm going to choose to believe that. Yeah, yeah we'll go with to, that. To look it's probably the other the way, but that's okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, catfish, I, they seem really aggressive. You remember when yeah. we were at Smith Mountain Lake? Oh, my God. Yeah, we were at Smith Mountain Lake, and they- and, Those things and, are, they go after it. Yeah, it was- uh, Those were carp. No, 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 no. Those were catfish. Yeah? Yeah, those were catfish yeah. that we, I remember you just- like threw popcorn in there and then our buddy he just waved his hand and they came up and they were crazy yeah yeah, yeah. and he socked one of them real hard yeah. too <laughs> hurt his kind hand of, kind yeah. of the point of it yeah <laughs> <Feet punching. laughs> yeah but that was uh that was yeah that was not too long after that there was that reporter that got shot there at that spot. oh yeah that's yeah. right that was crazy that was shooting yeah so uh, apparently it's it's kind of a, a reach of a metaphor in my opinion but the idea is that the catfish keep the cod on their toes. And so the, this like, you know, uh, uh, the catfish in the digital sense, it keeps you the, 
catfishy <laughs> on your toes. That's it that's is, the origin of of why they started calling it that. It it is a little weird. That that's a weird phrase that I don't think anybody understood the origins of it, and then we just all adopted. We're like, oh yeah, this is how this is what it is. It's called catfishing. Yeah, yeah. I'm never. It I'm bothered never, me enough to look it up. <laughs> no, that's that's good. Yeah. That's good. But the so one of the things that you're that your kind of assignment goes into is that if so, if they can kind of reflect on their own grooming methods, they can consider their own vulnerabilities, such as like loneliness, lack of confidence, you know, or enjoying having their ego stroked. Right. And how does that then put them in a better position to control for the likelihood of them being catfished themselves? Man, I, I think it just comes down to like, if you understand something, you, you know, that this it's kind of like the definition of internalization that you've that you came up with. You know, mm-hmm. that there's a whole they have to have the, you know, the the, pra- the the cognitive understanding. They have to get the concept. Yeah. And they have to have the the practical application. Right. Be able to put it into action and then the emotional appreciation. Right. And Some sort of reinforcement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it means something to them. And so I, I think when you put the client in the position of examining their own grooming methods from their point of view and really starting to consider that it, it it paints a clearer picture of being able to see it coming when it's happening to you. It, it might be, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if this is the same thing or different, but it, it might be related to like, you learn a skill way better once you teach it. Uh-huh. to somebody. Yeah. And this isn't in a sense you're not, I guess, I guess in a way they're teaching it if you're asking them to consider it in a group, but I don't know, like may, maybe you, I, I can think of examples of, you know, what I, I, I taught a class for a while, a, you know, a jujitsu class until I got selfish and wanted it to be all about me again. And, but, <laughs> and, and when, when I would teach a technique, uh, it could be a technique that I've done for you know 10 years and kind of is almost intuitive at this point when I'm trying to teach somebody that's never seen it before it makes me stop and have to think like, well, wait, how do I get into that position? What? And it, I end up having to be like, okay, wait, the, okay. The, the person I'm teaching isn't getting it. That's because they're leaving out this key step. Oh wait. Yeah. I shift my weight here when I, I didn't even realize I'm doing it. And so, and, and then I end up having a much greater understanding of, of the technique and I get better as a result of teaching it. And so may, maybe it's something similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think so. I think there's, as you're looking at these, like, um, they, they themselves were, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but there are a lot of parallels between what's happening to one of, say one of these guys getting catfished and, um, and, and what happened in their offense. I think there's a lot of parallels. There's a lot of similarities. And so having like engaged in those behaviors at the expense of another person just, you know, puts you in an, in a position where you can better recognize those if those are happening to you, or at least it should yep. with, with the recognition that perhaps the, the, um, the emotional, um, energy that you're dealing with at the time could be clouding your better judgment. And that's exactly what's happening, which, which I would assume too, um, you know, if, uh, you know, in, in the case of victimization on their, for their, for the people that they victimized, they would have had to, the the victim would have had to either, you know, just submitted because they were physically forced, like, which is what most people think. But in most cases, that's not what we deal with. In most cases, they took advantage of age, cognitive intellect, um, they, they were incapacitated. So in other words, like they, the, the victim also had to find themselves in a, in a diminished state of, of right. like good judgment or decision-making to engage in that behavior, or at least comply with that behavior or one way or another. And so, you know, we're, it's not necessarily, it doesn't seem like it's turning the tables. It's just saying, look, um, you have a unique way to take advantage of this because you you have yourself engaged in these behaviors. Right. So you should you should be better able to be able to pick this apart. But I think if you're just dealing with that loneliness and you don't have a whole lot of people around, then man, that's got to be tricky for them. I, so, exactly. But I think it's a good assignment. Has have, have uh, you uh, ran this in a group yet? Yeah, I did it out at the Reason yeah. Three building. How'd it go? They, they so. 
I started out by having those guys help me. I told them like, Hey, here's what I'm trying to do. And I, I went around and I asked them like, and, and it was more specific to the catfishing part and a couple of guys in there, sure enough, it had it happen to them. Yeah. And so I was asking them for like signs and like, okay, how did, you know, what, what are some things to look for? You know, how can you spot it? How can you see it coming? And just giving them a chance to talk about like, Oh yeah. If, uh, you know, if they, if they're from a different country or if they don't have very many friends on their social media, or if into meeting them, they fall for you really quick and tell you, Oh, you're not like other guys. I've never felt this way around you before. By the way, how much money do you make? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not fishy yeah. at all. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so kind of getting them, getting some engagement by saying, Hey, I need your guys' help to help me create this assignment. That boom, buy-in was there. Right. And, and so, they gave me some ideas. And then once I came back with it and taught it to the group, it, it went great. And it was, it was a closed off group too. Like, you know, we, we don't make clients talk about their offense and this, this group wasn't like the most vocal, but once I introduced the, you know, the four barriers thing and I had them talk about their offense without talking about the actual act itself by the, you know, the four barriers, uh-huh. man, like that by itself made for a killer group, like dudes that, sat quiet, got the courage to open up and, and talk about an ugly part of their history. And yeah. I felt like it was a productive group. And, and then, so it went really good. And then I don't know how it's gone for the other therapists that have done it. I've, you know, on the, the group role, the, the, the group channel, um, mm-hmm. I've noticed that some of our therapists have been teaching it. I'm not sure how it's landed yet, but yeah, it went good when I did it. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. This is, this is assignment number 48. We got four more. Yeah, and we've buddy. completed our, our, I know it's been a big project. it makes me feel like even more motivated to get those done. Yeah. So I'll get one done here soon. We'll kind of talk about that, but oh, yeah. um, yeah. And then we got a, yeah, we got, I think we got a, in the next one, one of these next ones, I don't, this is for a future one, not necessarily the next one, but we got to start. Um, Cause I think you and I have, have, agreed that we're, we're going to submit an abstract to ATSA. Yeah, dude. Right. And, uh, going over like working with, with, um, some of the more difficult, like cluster B personality disorders in group and how to work with them and be successful with them. Cause that is a very frustrating type of person to work with at times. Absolutely. So cool. All right. We have anything else to say on this? No. Thanks All for right. On that PowerPoint together. Well, dude. Merry Christmas, money. everybody. Word up. Remember those ants. If you, <laughs> dude, <laughs> terrifying. Just, I'm telling I'll, you. I'll, I'll give that to you. They're, they're pretty scary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Till next time.